Hello, Canaan and friends of Canaan. My name is Deacon Strother, and today I will be presenting uh, Canaan Baptist Church's Bible study series. I first want to thank Pastor Watson for allowing me the opportunity to be in front of the camera. Uh, before I begin, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity um, to wake up one more day, one more day to do your work. I pray that the words that come out of my mouth are pleasing to your ears. I pray that what is said today allows those to stand a little taller. I hope today that the words are gratifying and pleasing. I ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. The two verses of scripture that I've been led to today both come from the Old Testament. The first one is, comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And the other one comes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. This will sound a little backwards as I will begin with the last and end with the first. But in the end, it should make sense. Second Kings reads, she left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her sons, bring me another. Exodus 3 reads, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. May the Lord have a blessing to reading of his holy word. So to give further context to the story with 2 Kings, a woman who has now become recently widowed, she is speaking with Elijah. She tells Elijah that her husband, who is now dead, a God-fearing man, a faithful man, he's passed. And in his passing, his debt has now become the family's debt. And if she's unable to pay that debt, her two sons will be taken and placed into slavery. Now we can use the word slavery, we can use the word indentured servant, we can use the words uh, system of oppression. Um, they're all interchangeable. But the woman knew that if her sons entered into this system of oppression, they would never exit because the debt would never be satisfied. Elijah further tells her to gather up as many jars and containers as she can find, humble herself and go to her neighbors and ask them for any containers or jars that they may have. And once she's gathered up all those containers and jars to go into her home with her two boys and close the door. I guess if I had a title for this, it would simply be doors. There's something to be said, there's something very powerful about doors. Doors closing and doors opening. It said that there is no door that man can open that God has closed. And there's no door that man can close that God can't reopen. So as the story goes and as the story continues, this woman is in her home with these jars. Doors closed with her two boys. It's eerily similar to what's going on today. During this pandemic during this COVID-19. Our government has asked us, our governors have asked us, our mayors have asked us, the CDC, the health department, they've all asked us to go into our homes and close the door. Remain as socially distant from others as possible. Wear a mask if you have to go outside. But go inside and close the door. Now I know many of us are um, experiencing a bit of cabin fever. I believe today marks day 99 of when this whole thing began. 
And in this moment of cabin fever, we're getting a little tired and a little frustrated. You see, many of us are working from home, those that can. We are homeschooling our kids, our grandkids, or those that we are in guardianship of. We're just spending a tremendous amount more time with our families than we ever have. So I get it when you say it's a little frustrating. But if we go back to this woman in her home with these jars and her two boys and, and, and she's starting to pour this, this oil into the jars and as each jar is full, she says, give me another. This liquid golden fluid, this very life-saving fluid that could potentially save her sons from going into bondage. As we stem, spend more time with our children, we realize that we've been granted a rare opportunity, our own version of a miracle. We're having time with our children, our families, and we're having time to reset. <laughs> I must admit I've spent more time with my family in the last two plus months than I have in many years. Now, I know we live in this technological era. Uh, we live in this era of all-consuming technology. We live in this era of Facebook and emails and, and Instagram and, and Snapchat and Twitter. Just to mention a few, we, our world has become much smaller. I tell my students, the world is only a Google search away. We have all these different forms of communication, but some would argue and I will say it again, some would argue that we've actually lost a bit of our communication skills. We've lost that ability to have face-to-face -face communication. I was recently reminded of by my son as we were working on a project together with my grandson supervising. Dad, you were born before the internet. Now initially I thought he was kind of giving me a little jab, but I realized he was actually giving me a compliment. We were building this trampoline, and, and as we were building this trampoline, uh, we, we came to a part that did not necessarily fit together, as the directions had indicated. So we went back over the directions again and again just to make sure we had gotten it all right and realized mm, things weren't right. It, was, it still wasn't fitting. So I put my MacGyver hat on, and I started to work on this, and we ended up fixing it. And that's when he made the comment. You were born before the internet. Be born before technology was telling you what to do. You figured out what you needed to do. And as I reflect on that, it brought me back to remembering the times when we were in the home with our families, with our parents and grandparents, and they would sit us around a room and they would share all the stories of the family. They would share the, the, the rich history of the family. And I remember those times, just as they were pouring into us, we were trying to, to, to get as much as we can, as fill as many vessels as they could, fill as many jars as they could. So in this time of social distancing, with all the doors closed, we can commune with one another. We get to commune with God. We go to those quiet places in our home and just spend some time, that quiet time. I know that may sound strange coming from a, a person like myself, a person surrounded by technology, but sometimes we have to disconnect from everything else so we can reconnect with those that really matter. And this is our time. This is our mini mir miracle. So just as my son and I were working together and I was pouring to him, he was pouring back into me. My wife and I, we have this mantra, this thing that started off as a joke, but has soon become our new normal. We keep saying that regardless of whatever happens out in the world, whatever the government decides, whenever they decide to open up the restaurants and the movie theaters and the concerts and those large areas, those large venues, those large gathering areas, we are going to continue to have and live a COVID life for the rest of 2020. 
because we recognize this awesome responsibility that we've, we've been granted in this COVID world to be able to pour into those vessels around us and allow those vessels to pour into us. I know I said earlier that there's no door that man can close that God can't reopen. Or there's no door that God has closed that man can open. As I was going through this and as I was preparing for today, it, all these floods of doors kept coming back to me. I remember more specifically um, two instances growing up in, in Boston, growing up in the city. And I remember a, two doors in particular, one door in particular twice. I remember one time or multiple times running home, crying, tears in my eyes, running into the building and running upstairs, banging on the door, always to know that my mother was at the other side, on the other side and she was gonna open that door for me. And she was gonna open the door and I knew once that door closed behind us that the whole world, whatever was going on outside had stopped. And she was going to spend time kind of dealing with my wounds, dealing with my hurt feelings. Because when you grow up in Boston and when you grow up in, 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 in a city in a little bit fair skin, sometimes kids are not as nice as you may think they are. But she spoke to me and she talked to me and she counseled me. And, and as those of you that know my mother, she wasn't always, um, her, her words were a little colorful. But she always made it make real clear to me. She said, one day that, 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 that skin complexion is going to open up doors for you. And you have an awesome responsibility to make sure that you keep it open for the next person. And then I remember the second instance where this time I was running home with two people in hot pursuit. And I looked up in a window and I saw her in the window, so I knew she was home. So I ran in the building and they're still right behind me. And I get up to the third floor and I know I'm pretty safe now. I bang on the door and she doesn't open. I bang on it again. Ma, open the door up, open the door up, stop playing. And all I hear from the other side of the door is her saying, either you deal with them or I'm gonna deal with you. Now I mean, know many of you heard that before. If you don't deal with them, I'm gonna deal with you. So at that moment I knew what I had to do. And I handled what I needed to handle. And sometime later on that day, sometime later on that evening, I built up enough courage to ask Virginia, because yes, this was her house, so you needed to be very respectful in her house. I asked her, why didn't you open the door up? She said, because there were times that I was patching you up and, and helping you get through certain things and explaining certain situations. But this was a time that you needed to deal with it. And it was in that moment I realized that there were times that she was patching me up. She wasn't just patching me up. She was building me up. She was preparing me for something that I did not even, wasn't even aware of. She was preparing me, preparing me, preparing me. I guess some would argue she was preparing me for the time that she wouldn't be here to open that door up for me. So now we come to another door, the door in Exodus. It's more of a metaphoric door. Moses had closed the door to an entire life. He has shut the door. And as many understood the story, Moses had, prior to him being born, he had a death sentence. He had an order placed on his life before he was ever born. Pharaoh was in fear that an Israelite slave would rise up against him. So he ordered the firstborn males to be killed. In fact, every son that is born, you shall cast them into the river. Moses' mother had a different interpretation of casting him into the river. So in defiance or 
different interpretation of his order. Moses' mother placed him in a river in a little craft, a little basket, and pushed him down the Nile. All oh, the awesome faith that this woman must have had as she pushed her baby down the Nile. Her faith is undeniable. Now, for those of you that have kids or grandkids or people that you're in charge of, not having your kids in your vision for even a moment can be terrifying. In this moment of Father's Day, I remember a moment when my son was about four years old. And we were at the store, we were at a department store, and I swear I must have turned my back for 10 seconds, if that. And when I turned back, he was gone. I cannot tell you the fear that consumed my heart. Where is my kid? I spent the next minute or so searching for him. It felt like an eternity. I started calling employees and I started calling security. I dared not call his mother because I did not want to deal with that wrath. And we started looking and looking and looking and, and, and my mind is racing about what just happened to my baby. And a minute or so later, he emerged from one of those circular racks of clothes. He was hiding, he was playing with a big grin on his face. I can only imagine what he must have thought about at four years old, seeing his father standing there with tears in his eyes as I grabbed him and hugged him. I think I hugged him harder than I had in a long time. So for a mother to send her child down the Nile in a basket, the faith that she must have had that God was going to protect her child. Well, as most of you know, the rest of the story, Moses was found later by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses lived in Pharaoh's home for years, being cared for by his servants and ironically, his biological mother. Only for years later, to be hunted again by Pharaoh. Moses went from a death sentence to being served, to having another bounty put on his life. Moses was going through some things. But years and years and years later, Moses had reinvented himself. I would argue Moses reinvented himself and Moses closed that door. He locked that door. He probably nailed that door, put multiple locks to make sure that door would never open back up. We had this thing in Boston where you would use a, a police lock. That's an irony, we'll come back later. This big metal bar to hold the door shut. Moses is now married. He is tending to the sheep of his father-in-law. He is now standing on what they call the mountain of God, tending sheep. And now he's standing before a, a bush that's burning. I don't know what's more terrifying. A bush that's burning that's calling his name. Ooh. And Moses answered, here I am. And now he is being told by God, Moses, I know you locked that door. I know you closed that door. I know you nailed that door shut, but I'm reopening it. And more importantly, I'm reopening it for you to go back. Moses, I need you to go back to Egypt. And I need you to free my people. I need you to bring them out of Egypt. Because Pharaoh has his knee on their neck. He is taking the very life from them. 
So Moses, I need you to go back. I know this might be rough, but I need you to go back. And Moses' first response is, who am I? Moses must have thought he was just an obscure person. And now asking God, well, don't you've got some other people, some more important people to, to handle this? No, it's you, Moses. Moses, Pharaoh has his knee on the neck of my people. And I need you to go back to Egypt to free them from that oppressive system. And Moses says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, he says, who am I? Well, I guess God had to remind him. Moses, I have been watching over you before you were born. I knew you before you were born. I've been watching over you when that order was placed on your life. I was watching over you when your mother put you in that basket and sailed you down the Nile. Moses, I've been watching you. I've been watching you. I made sure that Pharaoh's daughter picked you up out of that, out of the Nile. I made sure that your mother was the person that's been watching over you these many years. I've been watching over you when you were in Pharaoh's home. I've been watching over you when they put another bounty on your life. I've been watching you when you escaped from Egypt. And yes, I've allowed you to go through some things. But now, I have a job for you. So that door that you may have locked, I now have opened. Because I need you to go back through that door. Go back through your past. Go back. Go back to Egypt. God has a way sometimes of making us go through some stuff. Just like my mother allowed me to be patched up sometimes, and this time I needed to deal with this. God has now patched you up. He has now built you up. He's been preparing you for years to go back to deal with this situation. So I say to you, how does that feel? When you're being told to do something that you just thought you weren't ready for, but now you realize you are. I say today that we're living in some interesting times, some very colorful times, times that the color of your skin could determine if somebody decides that they can take your life or call the police on you, a system that is designed to systematically oppress one while protecting the other. I guess when they said serve and protect, they meant serve and protect some, but not others. A system that makes one group think that they have this, their own police force, that they can call on someone else. Just like that Yale student that was sleeping in the common area of their own dorm and the police were called. Or I guess like the woman that decided she was going to call the police on a young girl that was selling water. Or the woman that thought it was okay to call the police on a black family in the park having a cookout. Or the Harvard professor who was trying to enter his own home and the police are called. Or what about the two men of color in a Starbucks and the police are called. Or a black man who is bird watching and a woman who is not in her correct place decides she's going to call the police and in front of our very eyes we watch her transform into this this, this, this person who is, a, who is attacking verbally and now on the phone, she is a victim as she calls the police and tells them she's being attacked by somebody that visually on camera, he's not even 10 feet, he's at least 10 feet away from her. Or what about a system that allows police officers to believe that just because of the way you look, they have the right to take your life. I guess if you're selling loose cigarettes, or maybe 
enjoying a bachelor party, playing with a toy gun, behind in child support. I guess if you're buying Skittles, you can be attacked by someone that thinks they're a cop. Or if you're jogging in a neighborhood, you can be attacked by somebody that used to be a cop. Or you can be asked to present your ID and be shot. Or maybe more recently, buying cigarettes. Or falling asleep at Wendy's. I asked the question, who's next? Could it be me? Could it be my kid? That is probably the biggest fear in my life. I recently spoke about how I'm in fear of my child as I was in fear that one time I lost him. We've all given our kids, especially our boys of color, but not exclusively, that talk. That talk, if the police pull you over, keep your hands on the steering wheel, don't make any sudden movements, and if you need to make a movement like getting your wallet or getting the registration, announce every move that you make. And at all times, be respectful. Even if the person is not being respectful to you, be respectful. Because a traffic violation could easily turn into a homicide. That is frightening. But it's not just frightening for him. My license is okay, my registration is okay, my tail lights are working, so on and so forth. And if I see lights behind me, I get a little nervous. And when they pass by, whew. but if they pull you over, all this goes through your head. It's time for us to stand up because I cannot take another person saying on TV, I can't breathe. Those words have become synonymous with fear. I can't breathe. From Eric Gardner to George Floyd, I can't breathe. All the while being respectful the entire time, he's saying, sir, I can't breathe. I can't imagine for the next eight minutes and 46 seconds saying, I can't breathe. Saying, sir. And in the end, calling for his mama. And for all those mothers out there, we know what that meant. Because she was on the other side, walking to him with open arms. She didn't want him there at that time. But if he had to be there, she was going to be there to welcome him and protect him. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm reminded of a few quotes. Um, one comes from, um, it was in the book of Diary of Anne Frank. It, it's a poem by Martin Niemöller. Um, and it read that first they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionist and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't speak out. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Dr. King said in a speech, I believe it was uh, a speech during the, the Vietnam War, and he said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Our lives begin to end the days we become silent about things that matter. And Malcolm X said, a man who stands for nothing 
will fall for anything. I say this because it's time for us to stand. It's time for us to stand and remain standing until these injustices stop. Until we cannot have to give that talk to our kids, to our sons, to our daughters. I want to live in a world one day where I can say to my son, you don't have to say that talk to your son. Or we don't have to watch on TV another person of color losing their life in eight minutes and 46 seconds. Or realizing that a man's life is worth, isn't worth a cigarette or $20 or a bag of Skittles. At what point are we going to just continue to stand? And yes, I know all of us cannot march. These young people that are out there right now, keep doing what you're doing. And for those of us that can't stand and march with them, we'll bring them water. We'll bring them supplies. So they can keep doing it. We'll give them access to platforms. We'll allow their voice to continue to be heard. Because it's only in the moments where light is shined onto darkness where this is going to end. So yes, I'm angry. I'm scared, sad. I'm scared. But more importantly, I am tired of hearing the words uttered. I can't breathe. But there's a silver lining to this. Because both of those stories I just mentioned, we know the ending. We know the ending to the story of the woman who when God said it was time for that door to open, when you have exhausted all of the vessels, all of the jars that you have, when you have poured into every jar that you have, take those jars, take some, and pay off the debt. And the rest, live a good life. We know that Moses, although Moses never stepped foot on that promised land, he fulfilled his destiny. So young people, keep doing what you're doing. Keep shining a light. Keep your phone out there. Keep recording and documenting everything that's happening. Because people are getting tired and people are getting frustrated and people are getting mad. And people are getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. And standing up and saying, enough is enough. I can't be silent anymore. I can't keep falling for this and then going back to my respective homes and thinking that this is all going to end. It's going to end when we stand and we continue to stand. Because I'm tired of hearing those words I can't breathe. 